that was a dark moment for me in my life where I was like, I was questioning God because my mom had died while I was in prison, overdose, I didn't get to go. My brother had died, I knew I wasn't gonna get to go. For me, it was a crucial moment. I was at a standstill and there were two roads there like, what are you gonna do? And I remember going to the day room and they had the paper up to sign up for Kairos. And I said, you know what, I'm gonna put it in. And just being able to release the grief that I had on me at that moment, you know, cause I was angry at God. I was angry at myself. You know, I was angry at my family for not telling me, for not being there. I mean, I was just, I was a mess at that moment. But I think at that particular reason, just me going into that Kairos walk, it was God's way of telling me like, hey, I got you. Hello, and welcome to More Than Sunday, a weekly podcast where we take a deeper dive into the stories, themes, and questions of our faith. My name is Eric Chikowski. I'm one of the worship directors here at First United Methodist Church Richardson, and with me every week, although remotely this week, as we both keep observing the shelter in place, is one of our associate pastors, Josh Fitzpatrick. Josh, good to be with you virtually yes, again. Yes, yes, it is good to be together. And this is a test of creativity and technology today. So as we talked about last week, we were trying to record as we were getting kids to bed. Well, so the kids are in bed right now, but now the challenge is trying to record while they're still asleep without waking them up. And so I am actually set up in our garage and uh, <laughs> I think it's working so far, but uh, definitely feels a little different than our usual little recording studio there at the church. <laughs> well, you sound great. I've done some weirder things recording music over the years, so uh, I won't go into all that stuff. Oh, but uh, We do what's necessary. That's right. We are continuing to live in the new normal, and that goes for the More Than Sunday podcast as well. But I'm constantly reminded of things I see and perspectives that people bring on some of the silver linings through this. This is obviously a difficult situation for all of us, but I've been encouraged to see just some optimism, some hope, and even some guidance on maybe ways for us to to shift our mindset during some of these things. For example, if we're just really feeling like we're stuck at home and we've got cabin fever and just really getting kind of stir crazy, just the reminder that we get to be safe in a shelter for hopefully many of us and maybe Maybe if we have people or pets to spend time with, or maybe Netflix or some other things to catch up on, that that's an opportunity for us to do that. Or, you know, if we're concerned about all of the things that are shutting down and life just doesn't look normal as we know it, that we can be reminded that the essentials are still open, that grocery stores and pharmacies and medical centers, even in some cases, if they're stressed to their capacity, that these places are still open for us. So just been really encouraged in some ways that there are are ways that we can, again, look for the silver lining in this situation. I love that. And I think you hit it on the head when you say that it's just a change in perspective. So instead of being stuck at home, we are safe at home and just recognizing that we have that blessing in the first place. I know for me, it's been encouraging to see our kids through all this and see their maybe lack of anxiety. We talk about having childlike faith and just having a childlike perspective in this and seeing that maybe they don't need the things that we think that they need on a regular basis to enjoy life. So just being able to take walks with the kids and get creative with the things that we're doing at home, art projects and whatnot, it's been really refreshing. You know, as we talk about changes in perspective and the ways that they shape the way we see the world, I'm reminded of an experience that I had that really shaped who I am even still today. When I was in college, I had the privilege of being involved in prison ministry for three years, really. And it was a surprise to me. It was a humbling experience because it wasn't something that I had planned on doing. I had some other goals and plans while I was in college. And I found myself in prison ministry as kind of a plan B. And yet this plan B should have been plan A from the beginning because of what an impact it had on my life to be able to go into R.J. Donovan Correctional Facility down near the Mexican border, south of San Diego, on a weekly basis and lead worship. Talk about putting things into perspective. I know that that was such a shaping experience for me. I've not been the same since. So we're excited to have a conversation about prison ministry today. And to kick off our conversation, we are so excited to welcome two members of First United Methodist Church Richardson that have been heavily involved with prison ministry over the years. We are so excited to welcome Bob Diggs and Mary Howard. Welcome. 
Well, today we are really excited for a conversation with two of our church members who are involved in prison ministry. We have Bob Diggs and Mary Howard. Welcome to the show today. Thank you. Thank you. So you've been members of our church here, First Methodist Richardson, for quite some time. Would you mind telling us just a little bit about your initial connection to the church? Well, I made the first connection. I was on honorable location as a United Methodist pastor, and I wanted a large church because it offers more opportunities. Mm -hmm. And I actually went to one closer to my home at that time, but I had to crawl over people to get a seat. And I just didn't feel welcomed. I came here, and the very first Sunday I was here, I went down and talked to John Ogden about locating my membership here. Wow. You just knew immediately. This is the church for you. Oh, that's cool. I knew immediately. Bob, what about you? So I'm married into the church. Okay. So uh, (laughs) one of the stories of our marriage is so right after we were married or somewhere in there, I was unchurched, raised in the church, but I had not been in church for quite some time. And it was Sunday morning and Mary was getting ready for church and I was laying around like guys who don't go to church do. (laughs) And she said very simply, well, I'm on my way to church, and you can come if you'd like to. And I, (laughs) I being the smart husband, (laughs) I picked it up and (laughs) changed clothes, and I've been coming ever since. And about 10 years later, I actually joined the church, Okay. which at that time surprised David Shaw. said, why is this guy walking down the aisle? And it was to bring my membership here. So I married in, if you can use that excuse. You can use that excuse. Yeah, that's excellent. We're, we're glad to have folks who marry in. That's great. So tell us a little bit about how you started getting involved with the prison ministry. That was simply somebody handing me an application for a Kairos weekend. I was serving on a walk to Emmaus team with him, and he said, I think this would be good for you. Well, I was not sure about prison ministry at the time. But I made the mistake of asking God if this is something I should do. Mm -hmm. And he said, why not? That was it. We live around the corner from Deborah Hobbs Mason. So I filled out the application, called her, said, can I come over? I need you to sign this. Signed it, mailed it in, and I started. God made it clear I needed to be on that first Kairos team. And do you mind setting the context for our listeners? What is Kairos and what does a Kairos weekend so, look like? So Kairos has a subtitle, A Basic Course in Christianity. It's a four-day activity inside prison. Its primary mission is to share the love and forgiveness of Jesus Christ with inmates. We do that through a series of talks, through a series of table conversations, through doing artwork together, just showing God's love by just accepting them as individuals. And then Kairos has a continuing ministry in what we call prayer and share, where the inmates that have been on a Kairos weekend gather together every week and walk through a series of questions about their spiritual journey. And we as volunteers come back in regularly and support that. So that first Kairos weekend was going in for four days and being part of a team doing that. So tell us a little bit more about your first visit. Do you remember that I I remember it clearly because I actually had no concerns about going in. Hmm. I've been reflecting on why is that, and I think part of it is the training. We go through a series of training sessions so that we know what to expect. And it's also kind of sounds like a sermon, being with your community, (laughs) being with other people, because you don't walk in by yourself, you're walking in with other people. And I walked into the chapel, and I had no concerns about being inside. I can't tell you why, but I'd had none. Now, Mary, were you on this first visit as well with Bob, or was your first visit a separate experience? I was on the support team, because in a men's prison, men go in, And women are on the outside doing the logistics, which is, number one, the prayer support, and then, two, the food. Mm -hmm. But there's some other things, too, that we do. So I was on the support team, but on the last day, typically a Sunday, we go in for the closing. And I do remember someone on that weekend coming up to me and saying, are you nervous about going in? And I said... Why should I be? I've been trusting God all weekend with my husband. I'm, <laughs> yeah. you know, so I'm not. Now. Yeah. Well, yeah. Now. <laughs> That's cool. So I have never been afraid inside. 
let's talk about that a little bit. I imagine folks might be nervous because they don't know if they'll be able to relate to prisoners or they might be nervous because of safety concerns. Talk a little bit more about the experience in there. And if I'm interested in getting into prison ministry, but I have that fear of safety, give us a little bit of an idea of what that looks like. For the most part, the people who are incarcerated are just like you and me. Somewhere along the line, they've made a bad mistake. I have found that the overwhelming majority of the women who are incarcerated have experienced abuse, Hmm. many of them as young children, as teens, as adults. Sometimes it started as a child and continues because that's all they know, and so they hook up with the wrong people. But, you know, they have the same desires. They have the same concerns for their family. Usually once you get past that first hurdle of talking with someone, it hasn't been an issue. It's so great to hear you say that. Josh and I have had opportunities to have conversations with people around folks struggling with homelessness. We get to talk to you guys today about prison ministry. So often it's so easy for us to see folks on the quote unquote other side of the fence as so much different than we are. And yet time and time again, we have these conversations and we're reminded they have the same hopes, the same dreams, the same emotions, the same connection or desire for connection to people. And so thank you for sharing that, Mary. That's a great reminder for us. And so, Bob, you started with the Kairos program, but then have expanded your prison ministry. What all do you do now? So my basic role is I teach some classes. On Wednesday, I go back down to Beto and teach a class to the most recent graduates of a Kairos weekend, a discipleship class to further their journey. But my most active role is I'm a volunteer chaplain, a certified volunteer chaplain in prison. I went through training and all kinds of stuff, and I've been a chaplain for about 15 years. Wow, okay. And now I'm serving over at Telford, which is in New Boston, so near Texarkana. So okay. I have a good trip over there, and I do all kinds of things. And when you talk about safety, so as a volunteer chaplain, I go to all parts of the prison. As a Kairos volunteer, you kind of constrained. You go here and there. As a chaplain, you're going into all parts. Of it. I still have no fear about it. Yes, something could happen. But to me, there's not a downside. She's got the downside. Uh, (laughs) No, seriously. I mean, the officers are there. They're there to protect Mm -hmm. other people. They're, you know, protect inmates against themselves, protect staff and volunteers from themselves and from inmates. So I'm not concerned at all. I really have no concern. And I've been in a room with 200 inmates and no officer, and I don't worry about it. I know it's not up to me. My safety's not up to me. Hmm. So I just turn it over. So the person concerned, it's if they could get past that and just turn it over. I think they'd be perfectly comfortable. Now, I imagine in all of the years y'all have been involved with prison ministry that you've got some memorable moments. Are, Are there a moment or two that you'd be willing to share with us that have really stuck with you? The very first time I worked at Mountain View, I was assigned a woman as her sponsor. So I was the one to meet her and to kind of keep an eye out for her during the weekend. She came in. She could barely lift her head. She looked like she had just gotten out of bed, was obviously very depressed and very heavily medicated. She would only answer yes or no, no matter how you phrased the question. Mm -hmm. And I found out after the weekend that at her table family, she never said a word all weekend long. So part of our ministry is to go back and to help them form their prayer and share groups. So typically the Saturday after the weekend, we go back and teach them all about how to do the prayer and share. When she came in, to that chapel, I almost did not recognize her. She was standing up straight. Her hair had been done. She had nicely pressed uniform on. She was smiling, and she was interacting. She was verbal. Wow. 
That's because on the weekend, we didn't push her. We didn't say, hey, if you're going to be in Kairos, you've got to do this or that. We simply loved her where she was. That was just the Holy Spirit working through the team. That is so cool. Thanks for sharing that, Mary. Bob, what about you? So probably some of my more memorable moments are as a chaplain. Mm -hmm. Because as a chaplain, we support everybody in whatever faith journey they want. And the interesting aspect of volunteers is probably 98% of the volunteers are Christian. So I find it interesting that Christians come in and they do things with inmates. As a volunteer chaplain, it's been really, really interesting to watch men in their faith journeys. And once in a while, they ask you, why are you doing this? And then I get to share my faith. Mm -hmm. I had a clerk who was a Wiccan, and we had great conversations about our faith. He about his Wiccan faith, me about Christianity, just the dialogue of two kind of different faith groups, just being honest with each other. He got out a couple of years ago. I don't know if he's converted to Christianity or if he's still practicing Wiccan, but just being able to help somebody in their faith journey and watch him grow, whatever it is, is really fun. Hmm. It's really fun. And I would imagine as you're speaking with inmates, you're at a time in their life when I would imagine they're questioning the decisions they've made and in a vulnerable time to reshape their future. How do you begin to guide those conversations? What type of questions are you asking or what does that conversation look like? So basically you ask questions about who they are. You get to know them. You get to understand their life journey and as part of that, their faith journey. Again, as a chaplain, I can ask deeper questions Mm -hmm. than some volunteers are willing to do. I can challenge them. And as they kind of reveal where they're at, I can guide them. If I feel like they're leaning towards Christianity, I can talk Christianity. If I feel like they're leaning a different direction, I can talk to them a little bit about that faith group and just guide them into that, not force them into it. But you know, it's just like loving them where they are. It's loving them where they are. And that's what Christians do. We love people where they are. And if they want to be a Christian, great, you know, but if not, great. (laughs) And that's part of, I think, a way my faith journey has grown in that, you know, probably 20 years ago, I was saying, well, I got to convert everybody to Christianity. I don't have that need, if I can use that word. I feel like whatever their journey is. That's what it ought to be. But it sounds like you have a lot of trust in the Holy Spirit in both of your explanations of yes. safety and in guiding uh, the inmates. And so I love this approach that you meet people where they are and you let them explore their own journey. And it sounds to me like you trust God to do the rest. Correct. Absolutely. Yeah. I love it. So if I or some of our listeners were interested in getting involved in prison ministry, where's the first place to start? How do we take that step? Well, I'll start this, and you can add to it. That There's a lot of different aspects to prison ministry. Not all of it is inside the walls. Prison ministry works with the inmates. It works with the inmates' families here on the outside. Mm -hmm. It works with victims of the crime. It works with staff inside prisons. And so part of it is where would somebody be interested? Because they may just be interested in doing a correspondence thing. They can minister through letters. Or they may feel like they want to minister to families. Well, there's Kairos Outside, which is a ministry on the outside for women who have somebody incarcerated. Or they might be involved in, well, staff. Maybe I can do something for officers. You know, they may be doing breakfast or some kind of thing for officer appreciation. Or they might want to go on the inside. And we take people inside through letters, through prayers, through money through their bodies. (laughs) Mm -hmm. There's a whole wide spectrum of being in prison ministry, whether you're inside or outside. And so part of it is exploring comfort level, but I try to push that because I say, you will be okay on the inside. You will be okay. And some of it is try it once. There's also the opportunity. There's the closing that I referred to. If you're 18 or older, you can apply to go to a closing. 
And that's when the inmates get up and have the opportunity to share what the weekend has meant to them. And you can hear some powerful stories that way. And you say, maybe I want to be a part of that. So that might be a good first step. Yes. Visit the closing of a Kairos weekend. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Well, hey, this has been super informative, and I appreciate your willingness to share with us. So we do have one last question, though, that we ask everybody on the podcast, and we'll ask both of you. At this point in your life, what is one thing that you wish someone would have told you? Well, mine doesn't really relate to prison ministry. And that's okay. (laughs) And I'm still waiting for someone to tell me, and that is, how do you lovingly care for an aging parent? Are you in the middle of it right now? Yes. Yes. It's a, a tough journey. It is. They didn't come with a manual. No. <laughs> <laughs> Kids didn't come with a manual, and then parents at the other end of the journey, yeah, yeah parents don't either. Yeah. They yeah. don't come with a manual. Yeah. You need to visit missybuchanan.com. I have read some of her books. And she's got some great resources. <laughs> yeah. So for me, I'll stick to the prison thing. I wish somebody would have warned me that it's a boundless opportunity, that whatever your passion is, if you really stick with your passion— you don't know where it's going to go. 20-plus years ago, started Kairos. Oh, it was fun, great, very fulfilling. I had no concept that I'd be a volunteer chaplain, that I'd be spending three, four days a week inside prison doing ministry. I mean, it's almost a full-time job without a full-time job. Yeah. And I probably wouldn't have changed my getting involved, but— that has been the reflecting back that, wow, you got to hang on to that horse. <laughs> sure. Because you don't know where it's going to go. And that's the fun part, being able to just stay in the saddle and just go wherever God takes you. Mm. So. <laughs> well, Bob and Mary, your stories and experiences are inspiring to listen to and to chat about. And Bob, your encouragement to try it once is ringing in my ears. And we've heard that from a number of folks that we've talked to about different ministry areas and want to encourage our listeners to do that. Thank you so much for your time and sharing your stories today. It's been great to have you. You're welcome. You're welcome. I just love the way that Bob and Mary talk about the leading of the Spirit, leading them into prison ministry in the first place, but then also seeing how much they are led by the Spirit in the conversations they have, in their presence with the inmates. It's really inspiring to see how sensitive they are to God's leading. It is so good to hear Bob and Mary's experiences and their willingness to share those. We've got a unique opportunity now to have a conversation actually with a former inmate that Bob specifically has worked really closely with. So we're going to continue talking with Bob, but Mary's going to shift over and we're really excited to welcome to the podcast, Albert Reyna. We're really excited for the second half of today's episode as we've had Albert Reyna in the studio with us today. Now, Albert is a former inmate that Bob had worked with at Beto, and so we've done some seat shuffling here, and Albert has taken Mary's seat, and Bob's still here at a microphone. And so, Albert, just welcome. Welcome to the podcast today. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. Now, we'd like to set some context usually for our listeners, and we're really excited to hear your story and, again, appreciate you being here. Would you mind telling us a little bit about your journey and what brought you to prison in the first place? Well, I grew up in Houston, south side of Houston, and my mom was a prostitute slash heroin addict. I grew up with my grandparents who were alcoholics. I had eight sisters and two brothers, all got different dads. So I grew up just in a house where my grandparents didn't tell me they loved me. My grandpa didn't teach me the responsibilities of what a man is or what a man does, any of that. And so when I turned 13 years old, joined the street gangs in my neighborhood, and I never looked back. In 2015, I was released from prison, and this is the longest I've ever been out of any institution since I was 13 years old. Wow. Walking with Christ and going to church, and so it's excited. I do have a wife. I have three kids now, and so I'm just very blessed. Wow. So what was it that made you first sort of convicted to go check out a Kairos experience? Well, I was already a believer. I was on the faith-based wing on Beto. It's E-wing, the faith-based wing. And, you know, everybody puts in for it. 
And like I said, it's kind of like a trap is the way I see it because they kind of bait you in with the food. So people are like, they're going in just for the food, <laughs> sure, but, sure. but little do they know. That they're going to find yeah, Jesus. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> we do that I, a lot too. I, yeah. I was like, I'm a believer already. You know, I don't need to put in for Kairos. I'm good. But on the, on the flip side of that, I was seeing people come back from Kairos with this glow, with this excitement, you know, and just like I was seeing the transformation and, you know, curiosity killed the cat. And so I was like, man, but I felt like, I don't want to take a spot of somebody who really needs it because I'm already a Christian. You know what I mean? So that was like always my thought process there. And then one day I was going to dump my tray. I was in a chow hall. You have about 300 men in the chow hall at one time. And I was putting my tray in the scullery. And one of my neighborhood friends had come up to me and he said, hey, uh, I'm sorry to hear about your brother. And I said, what? He said, your brother, he passed away. Well, I had no clue. Hmm. So I'm like, really? Because when I was in prison, it was like I was dead to my family. I mean, I don't get letters. I don't get visits. I don't get nothing. And so that was how I found out that my brother died. So I run back to my cell. I write my sister a letter. I said, did he die? What's going on? You know, or is this what we mean? So about a week later, she wrote me back. And when I was opening the letter, the obituary fell out. And sure enough, he overdosed. Mm-hmm. And I remember for me, like, that was a that was a dark moment for me in my life where I was like, I was questioning God because my mom had died while I was in prison, overdose. I didn't get to go. My brother had died. I knew I wasn't going to get to go. I mean, if they didn't let me go to my mom. They're not going to let me go to my brothers. And so for me, it was a crucial moment. I was at a standstill and there were two roads there like, what are you going to do? And I remember going to the day room and they had the paper up to sign up for Kairos. And I said, you know what, I'm going to put it in. And so I just slipped it in. And you know what? My first try, I got in. Mm -hmm. And you got some people have been trying to get in Kairos for 10 years, five years. And for some reason, you know, Kairos, the Latin word, it stands for God's timing. It's what Kairos stands Mm -hmm. for. And I made it in on my first try. And, And like I said, it wasn't about the food. But you know what? Just being able to release the grief that I had on me at that moment, you know, because I was angry at God. I was angry at myself. You know, I was angry at my family for not telling me, for not being there. I mean, I was just, I was a mess at that moment. But I think at that particular reason, just me going into that Kairos walk, it was God's way of telling me, like, hey, I got you. One little note, so Beto's a 3,500-man prison. When the poster goes up for Kairos, we used to get about 400 applications for 42 slots. Oh, wow. So you got a lot of competition, and... It's really a Holy Spirit thing. Who is the 42? That's a different process someday. So for him to be chosen meant God needed him on Mm. the weekend. And is that number limited just because of number of people involved with Kairos? 42 is the model. Okay. Seven tables of six inmates and three team members. So that's about the most you can do because of all the logistics that happened here. And I think they try to spread it out like six Hispanics, six whites, six blacks, six mm-hmm. other. You know, they mm-hmm. try to keep it, you know, where it's Recently, balanced. Recently. Yeah, so that way there's no complaining or anything like that. Yeah. And so you had this incredible weekend. And then, as Mary previously explained, you come back from a Kairos weekend. You're part of a prayer and share. Prayer and share. Now, did you join a prayer and share? Yeah. Group? So you go every Saturday morning. Okay. Uh, you'll get a lay in if you want to go. Now, if you don't want to go, you don't have to go. But if you miss two, you won't get a lay in anymore. Lay in is like a pass to come out and go to the chapel down okay. there. And I did. I did. I continued to go for the rest of the time that I was there. And just a couple of key things that I wanted to cover, you know, like y'all were saying about joining. You know, if you went down there, and you just stood there and didn't say a word to nobody. I mean, not a word. You just went down there and it was like quiet, like just looking. Mm-hmm. You would get probably about 10 or 15 inmates that would come thank you for even taking the time out of your day. Because they may not have got a visit in 20 years. Mm-hmm. And just for you to take the time out of your day to show up, even though you didn't say nothing, they would be that much wow. grateful that you even went down there. And you don't have to say a word. Just to be present. Yeah. I used to hear the volunteers say, hey, guys, y'all bless me so much when I come in as an inmate in white. I was like, this guy gets to go home today. How, how do I bless him? But now that I'm a volunteer, I'm like, hey, guys, y'all bless me coming in. Mm-hmm. And it's like now I got to see both sides of it, you know, because it's like I was walking at the park last week and I was thinking, you know, I take this walk for granted. But I remember when I first got out. 
Everything meant so much to me. I was happy to go to the store. I was happy to put gas in my car. I was happy to walk out the park. But now that I've been out five years, it's so easy to get just, you know, leveled out, planed out, and just be like, oh, I'm just at the park. You know, it's mm -hmm. nothing. But it was like God was telling me, like, don't forget where you came from. Don't forget that. Like, be grateful for what you have. You know, because it's so easy to get in a slump and, you know, just find anything to complain about. But God was like, this walk in the park is nice. Yeah. Like, I remember when I was in a cell and I was wishing I was at a park walk-in, you know. And so don't take it for granted. Mm. So tell us about the first time that you met Bob. I remember Bob going in on the walk, but I think the most memorable time that I remember Bob was he sat in one of my prayer and share groups. And like I said, when I go back and I go in my groups— it's like, I don't even really have to say anything. These guys are ministering to me. They're filling me up. You know what I mean? It's not so much about me going down there trying to make a point or trying to say, I'm in regular clothes and you're in white, so you're going to listen to me. That's not really what it's about, you know. But Bob is always up there. He's always smiling as usual, <laughs> uh, you know, and just encouraging us down there, you know. And that's what it's all about. But I did want to elaborate a little bit on what she was saying about the closing. In my walk, when I was in White Still, the Islams down there, they don't have preachers that come down there like the Christians. They run their own. And there was a guy there, he might remember, his name was Hearn. Uh, I don't remember his first name, but his last name was Hearn. And he was about 6'5". And the whole time in the walk down there, the four days, he never ate. Like, he didn't eat the food. I think, and I think it might have been during Ramadan. That might have been one of the years. Well, 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 years we so. thought that. And I remember everybody was like, this guy's not eating. What's going on? Because, every, I mean, they have homemade pie, homemade, well, at the time oh, it was homemade, homemade food, cookies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> everything's homemade, okay? And this guy wasn't eating. So at the closing, the 42 individuals get to go up there and tell what they learned that weekend, what they're taking back with them. They get to just share their experience. So Mr. Hearn gets up there. And he says, I didn't come down here for the food, he said. And this guy is probably about 60, 70 years old. He's, he said, I've been Islamic my whole life. And he said, my whole purpose of coming to this walk was to convert everybody to Islam. And he said, after being here four days and experienced the love that y'all poured in me, I am now a follower of Jesus Christ. No. And when I tell you that that chapel, I've never felt the ground rattle to this day. Wow. But when I tell you everybody stood up and started screaming and clapping and just praising, because you now you have the people that come in for the closing, they're on one side, and then you have all the inmates in white on the other side with the volunteers. And when I tell you both were like on one accord just praising God, I mean, it was something that I'll never forget. And I still give that testimony today to everybody. And that happened in 2009. But just the kairos, the love that you experienced down there, with people like Bob and I that come down there now and volunteer and just give our time back to them and let them know that they're not alone. Because being in prison, you do feel alone. No matter what kind of mask you got on, whether you're in the gang or, you know, when I was in there, I had these gang members come, hey, man, can you pray for my mom at night? You know, coming like Nicodemus, just, you know, they didn't want their friends mm -hmm. to see them come ask me to pray for them. But like she said, everybody's hurting. And I do believe everything goes back to your childhood. You know, like she was saying, everything, you know, I mean, I tell the people that all the time, you know, you're not responsible to what happened to you as a child, but you are responsible to how you react to what happened to you as a child. You know, I can always point back to my childhood, but one of the things they do in Kairos, Bob here can testify, is that they give you this rice paper and they have you write down with a red pen people that you want to forgive. And then when you throw it in the water, it dissolves. And you're saying that you forgive whoever. Now, I'm not going to go to Bob and say, hey, who do you got down there or anything <laughs> mm -hmm. like that? You know, this is personal. I mean, this is a real critical, crucial moment for you in Kairos. And, you know, I was sexually molested as a child. I was, you know, mentally, physically, uh, verbally abused. And so, you know, after you're verbally abused as a little kid, you start believing that you're really stupid. You know, after people are telling you that for so long, you're dumb, you're stupid, you're not going to be a nobody. You start acting like that. You start acting stupid. You start acting dumb. You start thinking you're a nobody. And I remember writing down on the paper all my family members, and I threw it in, and I was crying. But so I got out, and my family's in Houston, and my grandma passed away probably about a year and a half after I was out. I got to see my grandma one time, and then she passed away two months later. And I remember for the whole 10 years that I was in prison, I was saying, God, let me see my grandma one more time. Please don't let her pass while I'm in it. 
I saw her one time. And I thought, what if I would have said 10 more times or, you know, <laughs> I mean, you know, it just the thought was there. Well, a year later after my grandma passed, my wife is from Oklahoma and she loves Galveston and Houston. I'm, I'm sick of it. You know, I'm from Houston. <laughs> I've been to Galveston and got stung by many jellyfish. It's, it's nothing to me. So we're going down there and she says, hey, um, doesn't your grandpa live around here somewhere? And I said, yeah, he lives right up there on the next exit. And she said, uh, let's go visit him. And I said, no, he's all right. See, it's easy to walk around and say, I forgave that person or I have nothing against him. But it's easy to put that in the closet. It's easy to sweep that under the carpet and put a smile on your face and act like it's not there. But little did I know that I was still mad at him, that I still had bitterness towards him. But I was supposed to be this Christian, so I was covering it up like I wasn't mad at him. And she said, man, let's go visit him. So we went down there and we visited him. And he had lost like 100 pounds. He had had a stroke a couple years ago. He was on a walker. And, I mean, he just looked at horrible. And my wife said, hey, um, let's take him back up there with us to Dallas. She, she had brought me outside. And I said, no. I said, he'll be all right. We'll, we'll just go buy him some groceries and fill his refrigerator up. And then she hit me with the, but you're supposed to be this Christian, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, Jesus. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, why? So <laughs> so when I go back in, I'm like, hey, you want to go with us to Dallas? And before I can even finish saying that, he was ready heading to the door, you know, with his walker. And he was ready. And he, he jumped in the front seat and he was buckled up and he was smiling. And I was like, OK, I don't know where this is going. I'm like, but let's do it. So we get in there. I'm like, hey, man, one week, man. I'm bringing you back next Saturday. So just one week down there. So we go down there. Well, that was like in, I think, 2016 or 17. That was when that hurricane hit Houston, and his house got submerged underwater. Mm. And I believe he would have died. I mean, he was already handicapped. So he ended up moving in with us. So I got him going to church with me, and, you know, he was always claiming he was Catholic and this and that. So, so I got him going to church, and, you know, he had been drinking my whole life. He had been drinking since he was 16. He was 80 years old. Now, when he moved in with me, he was drinking about 16 beers a day. Well, it had got all the way down to where he was drinking one a day. And I was taking him to church and all that. And one day, I finally got the courage, and he was sitting at my kitchen table, and I sat down, and I said, hey, man, I want to ask you a question. I said, you don't have to answer. I said, it's cool. I said, but I just want to know one thing, and I told him. And I'm not, I don't mean this in no ill will. I don't mean this trying to be, you know, a vengeance or nothing like that with you, I said, but why did you do them things to me when I was little? I said, I, I just need to know, man. I said, but if you don't want to answer, it's okay. I just need some closure, man. Because I was mad at him. And he looked at me with tears in his eyes, and he said, that's what my dad did to me when I was little. I mean, how could he give me something that he didn't have? So... It all made sense in my mind. I mean, my wife taught me to tie a tie on my wedding. My wife taught me how to change the oil to the car. My wife is from the country, you know, in Oklahoma. She grew up on the farm. He didn't teach me any of this. But how can he teach me something that he didn't know? And here I was mad at him. So he asked me to forgive him. I asked him to forgive me. I led him to Jesus Christ. He died one week later. But, you know, I got to get my closure I got to, uh, you know, just squash it all between me and him. And so it was just all on God's time. And, you know, and like I said, I think for the Kairos when I was in prison at that crucial why in my life, you know, it was either go this way or that way. And what are you going to do? You know, and I think Kairos had really at that moment, it saved my walk. It really did. Albert, we're kind of speechless because you can just see in your words that you have had the courage to let God guide your steps. And we thank you for being open and honest and sharing your story with us. It's incredible to see the power of the Holy Spirit and how your journey has gone the way that it has and the way that you've been open to the leading of the Holy Spirit in your life. Thank you so much for sharing that with us today. So you had this experience with Kairos, this why in the road. You decide to go the way of Christ and obviously your outcome is different than it would have been had you taken the other path. And now that you're on the outside, you find yourself giving back. And so how often are you going back and what does that look like at this point? Well, you know, when I first got out, 
you know, you have to wait two years before you can go back. Okay. In. I was still on parole. So my parole officer had to write a letterhead to Huntsville saying he's been complying. He's passed all drug tests. I agree he should go back in, you know, because you build a chemistry with your parole officer. And for me, if you come in contact with me, you're hearing about God. I mean, there's just no <laughs> ifs and buts about it. You're going to hear something. And so, I mean, it's quite obvious. And so I went back in there and then we had a summer retreat. We do a fall retreat, Christmas retreat. We do different retreats during the year that we go back in. And I gave my testimony about something that had happened while I was out here. And this other ministry was there, Real Life Ministries. And they ran up to me and they go, hey, man, you ever thought about doing prison ministry? And I said, yeah, I really believe that's my calling. They said, look no further. And so this ministry took me to Telford, Ferguson. We went to the Hobby Unit, Beto, Cofield, Michael Unit. I mean, I started going to all these different units. I st- regularly, I started going to seven different units. And then I came home one day and my wife asked me for a divorce. She said, you're, you're spending more time in prison than at home with us. I don't, I don't need you if it's like that. And, you know, it's just like... The devil is so crafty, you know, and he's like so cunning that you think you're doing the right thing. And it's like the prison ministry became a second relationship to me. And I put my family on hold because I felt it was the right thing to do. And so I cut them all out. I mean, just like on the drop of a hat, I was like, I'm done. I'm not doing nothing. And so I end up finding me a mentor. And he said, look, just take a break. Prison ministry is always going to be there. Just focus on your family right now. They should be before the prison ministry. And so I waited for about six months until my wife finally said, hey, you can go ahead and go back if you want. And so I just stuck with the Kairos. So I was doing Kairos, and then I was doing Friday nights on Beto. And then I kind of just didn't feel peace about it anymore. So I'm like, I'm just going to stick to Kairos. Like, I know Kairos is legit. So I just I'm trying to balance everything out in my life, you know, with work and my family and doing a little prison ministry. And then, you know, it's because my kids are growing. And I was coaching both of my daughter's soccer teams. You know, they're five and seven. And so that was a handful, something that I did not expect. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, so <laughs> just trying to balance it all out. That's so beautiful, Albert, just. To hear all of the ways that you've been blessing folks and that God's been blessing you in your life. And you truly are a walking testimony of the redemptive power of Jesus. And it's so beautiful to hear those stories. You heard us earlier ask both Bob and Mary this question, but we'd love to ask you this question now. Up to this point in your life, what is one thing that you wish someone would have told you? Um, you know, I, I got the cheat. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you got time to think about this. <laughs> but I think... You know, as a kid, I wish that somebody would have told me that, that they loved me and that I was somebody and that I can be whatever I, you know, put my mind to, you know, because that wasn't what I heard as a kid. And I think I saw too much as a kid, you know. And for me, doing the things that I did, it was the norm to me because that was the kind of neighborhood I grew up in, you know, until I went to prison was the best thing that ever happened to me. Prison saved my life. And I look back sometimes, and I'm like, had I not gone to prison, I probably wouldn't be where I'm at today. And I don't believe in chance. I don't believe in luck. I don't believe in coincidence. I believe that the day that I came into contact with God, it was like God set me up. I just really wish that somebody somebody would have told me that. One of the things I love about your story is the way that you talk about your walk in the park and not taking that for granted now that you're on the outside and wishing that someone would have told you, I love you. And the whole story about your grandfather saying, well, that's what I received. And you could be full of bitterness, but yet you're choosing to be that cycle breaker and to live your life in a new way because of what you've learned and because of the way that the Holy Spirit has worked through your life. So, Albert, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. We really appreciate your vulnerability with us. Thank you. And your honesty. Thank you for being here. Thank you. It was an honor to be here. So many times throughout these conversations, I felt like we were hearing holy moments in the headphones, whether through Bob's and Mary's experiences working with inmates through their time in prison ministry, or through Albert's candid and incredible stories about the way that God's worked in his life. You know, when they first arrived to the studio, the first thing Albert said to us after we introduced ourselves and shook hands was, I'm an open book, ask me anything. And we so appreciated and frankly were moved by his experiences and his willingness to share those with us. You know, as United Methodists, part of our heritage and our legacy comes 
from a deep history of prison ministry. John Wesley and some of the earliest people who called themselves Methodists would visit prisons on a regular basis. They saw that as an essential part of Christian ministry. And that isn't a new thing. That was something that was founded on something that the earliest Christians back in the New Testament would do on a regular basis. And so to that end, we want to leave you with a scripture today from the book of Hebrews that talks about the benefits of visiting those who are in prison. This is Hebrews chapter 13. Let mutual love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing that, some have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember those who are in prison as though you were in prison with them. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of More Than Sunday. If you like the podcast, please feel free to share it, go online and leave a comment, or give us a rating so that others might hear about us. We've got a new episode coming out every Wednesday, so make sure you also subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts so you don't miss our next episode. If you want to find out more about First United Methodist Church Richardson, you can find us online at fumcr.com as well as on Facebook and Instagram. Special thanks to Bob Diggs, Mary Howard, and Albert Reyes for joining us this week. And make sure you tune in next Wednesday when we have a conversation about Network of Community Ministries. Have a great week. Thank you.